We've been seated for a little while. Let's just stand. It's just one verse of scripture that we want to read this morning. I don't know, maybe there's somebody there you need to just tell them, turn around and say to them, shake their hand and say, I just want to thank you for being here this morning. Maybe there's somebody like that you need to do that too this morning. Go ahead, just turn around and whoever's right around by you there, say thank you. I'm glad you're here this morning. Amen. Amen. I'm just so glad you're here this morning. Thank brother. God. I'm glad you're here Thank this you. morning, brother. Thank Amen. God. Amen. God worked it up. Amen. He sure did, brother. Thank God. Thank the Lord. <clears throat> Psalm 51 and 17 reads this, the words of the Lord. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. The sacrifices of God are a broken, a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O oh God, thou wilt not despise. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for coming in this camp meeting. Service after service, you've been here, Lord. We've seen the hand of God stretched out still. Oh, God, holding back your anger and wrath and pouring in mercy and grace and oil upon us. You've helped us and you've blessed us and you've touched us, oh, God, in many ways. We thank you for the preaching, oh, God, of Brother Smart in this meeting and how our hearts have been blessed and stirred. And we pray, Father, that you'd give him help tonight and, and on Sunday, Lord God, in the closing services of this camp meeting. It's hard to believe, Father, that here we are on Friday morning and have come this far but we pray that you'd pour out your spirit. Continue to help the Victory Trio as they minister, Lord, and, and labor. And there'll be new folk coming in on these grounds today, Lord. And there'll probably be a large crowd here tonight. And oh, God, help us uh, as believers to have our cups filled to overflowing. Uh, that there might be an atmosphere of the holy and the hallowed uh, and the reverent here in our midst. And people will know that God is here because the people of the Lord are broken and blessed before him. Uh, we're asking, Father, that you'd give us help in the remaining moments of this service today we need it uh, and we ask for your help we pray that your hand would touch us and give us that anointing as only you can do bless each one that's in this room father go beyond our expectations today and help us for we ask it in jesus name and amen you may be seated there's a scripture over in isaiah chapter 57 and verse 15 listen to these words it says for thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place. But with him also that is of a contrite and broken spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. The humble and the contrite ones, talking about broken people. The Lord is near unto them that are of a broken heart and saves those that are broken. He revives those that are broken. He healeth the broken. He blesses and binds up the wounds of the brokenhearted. And friend, he dwells in the midst of a broken people. Amen. Oh, how necessary and important it is this morning and every day of our life to be broken. Broken in heart and broken in spirit. This is what pleases God. Do you know what pleases God this morning, friend? That you and I have a broken heart and that we'll be a broken vessel for him to use. This is where God dwells. He dwells in and heals broken vessels. In the sacrifices of the Old Testament, they were, they were not designed to take away the sorrowful and penitent spirit of the one offering them, but actually those sacrifices in the Old Testament were made to make those, that sorrowful and broken heart of the one giving that sacrifice more lively, actually more aware of their need of God and more broken. When the priests and the people beheld that dying lamb or that, that dying dove whom they had made their substitute, he was to realize in a real way the fearful extent of that sentence of sin that that individual should have received. This was to produce a humble and broken spirit in the one that was offering up. And that was what was to delight God. It wasn't so much the shedding of the blood or the animal itself, but it was in the brokenness of the heart before the Lord. What a sight, that white bleeding lamb with its throat cut, 
the beautiful white wool smart with blood. And their offerer of that lamb was to take it with brokenness and contrition to God. What a sight, that bleeding lamb. But listen to these words recorded in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he, God, hath made him who, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, friend. Oh, friend, when we look to the Savior upon the cross, we realize the great penalty of sin. That is ours. That is ours. Judgment, death, and hell when we look to see Jesus on the cross. That's what we deserve. A second death and then the, the fires of hell. Yet, friend, he did it all for us. And when we realize he did all of that because of our sin, friend, it ought to produce within us a brokenness every time. Not just when we make that first trip out of our seats into an altar of prayer and kneel down to be saved. Not just when we come to him to be sanctified holy, but when we come to him over and over, we behold the lamb that taketh away the sin of the world, even my sin. Friend, take a little time once in a while to come down before Almighty God and before the Lord Jesus Christ and thank Him for the blood and thank Him for the wonderful provision and thank Him for dying and being a substitute on your behalf. Amen. Amen. The sacrifices of the Old Testament, however, became so familiar to the priests and the people that they would offer them up almost professionally as it were without feeling or without emotion really they just became like a lot of butchers in any old slaughterhouse they could slit the throat of the do the, the uh, lambs they could kill the doves uh, it was just a blood thing going on just like a bunch of butchers they got so used to it friend you can just about get used to anything you can just about get over anything. You can harden your heart and steel yourself against so much. I remember back in the early 70s, I used to work in a packing house. We slaughtered 125 pigs an hour. That's a lot of pigs, brother. When we were slaughtering beef, 12 beef an hour. That's a lot of knives moving. That's a lot of blood flow, and that's a lot of slop. Amen. That's a lot of eviscerous. That's a fancy word for guts. But I remember getting that job in that packing house. And I'd never been inside of a packing house in my life before I was 19 years old. And they walked me into the kill floor. And when I walked onto the kill floor, it was hot and steamy and water was dripping down. Pig hair dripping down. I was standing right underneath of a big de heron machine and there were four hogs swirling around above me and hair and slop was dropping down on me. Almost got sick. The smell was awful. I looked over and there was a fellow up on a stand. The hogs would come out. Of, they would First of all, the hogs would be run into a chute and a fellow would put a, a thing over their head and knock the hog down and put a chain on its leg and run it up a chute and out over a place and there would be a man up on a high gamble up there and he would cut the throat of the pig and the blood would drip into the blood pit. Then after that, they would put him in a, de or a scalding tank and they'd come into the de-herring machine and they'd come out to where the shavers were, shaving the hair off and go over to where they were taking the insides out, cutting the heads out, cutting the ears off and the tail. Friend, they used everything of that pig except for the squeal. <laughs> but I looked over there and I seen this one fellow, his name was Ray. And I got to meet him after a while. But I noticed he was gutting the hogs out. That's what his job was. And my, he was fast. He'd stand there sharpening his knife, and when that pig would come by, he'd reach up, make two slats like that, and throw that whole pile of eviscerous right into one of those tables for the inspector to look it over. And I noticed as I was watching him that first day, he reached up, took a slit like that, and threw that big pile of eviscerous over on that table, and then he reached in his apron, pulled out a bologna sandwich, and took a bite and stuck it back in. Oh, 
Oh, I hope you don't have pork chops for lunch. I could hardly stand it. But do you know something? It wasn't two weeks until I was doing the same thing. I could eat a bologna sandwich anywhere in that place. Just got used to it. Just got over it. Just got used to it. Friend, you can get over anything. But I'm here to ask you this morning, I pray to God that you'll never, ever, ever get over what Jesus has done. I'm afraid too often in our circles, friends, too often in our circles, we have gotten over what Jesus has done. We've become so used to the things of Christ that they don't stir our hearts anymore. The same is true today about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Many not moved by it or broken by it at all. They have the same old familiar spirit with it that the priests did back there when they were cutting up the lambs. They got used to it all. Oh, God, break us up. Make us to be broken before you. I've been over in, the, in Israel, and I can remember being there when those beautiful northern winds would come down out of the, of the Jordan Valley. Those northern winds would come down across the Sea of Galilee, and as soon as the winds would hit the Sea of Galilee, Sea of Galilee is beautiful fresh water from out which the Jordan River flows down through. And those northern winds had come down across the Sea of Galilee, and they would just stir the water up and cause the water to be rippled. There would be waves and sometimes whitecaps, and the water would be broken up. And that same wind would blow down out of the north across the south, down through the Jordan Valley over top of Jericho, and right on down to the Dead Sea, where the water is very heavy, filled with salt, and those same winds that broke up the Sea of Galilee, those same winds did absolutely nothing to the Dead Sea waters because of the heavy salt content there. The waters are so heavy, friend, you don't even have to know, know how to swim. You can just go out and lay down in them and your head will stay above water. Friends, you and I have seen it over and over and over again. The blessed, sweet presence of the Holy Ghost has come into service after service and he swept over hearts and hearts were blessed and hearts were broken. Some were weeping and crying. Some were shouting. Some were making their way to an altar. Some were moved upon. But that same breeze blew over some and they were hard as rocks, hard as nails and they never moved and never stirred at all. They weren't broken not about to be broken. They remain indifferent and full of apathy. Friends, we have too much indifference in our circles and too much apathy in our churches. If we would be more broken, friend, God would move upon us more. Listen, friend, let me ask you something. I'm not asking you if you're saved and sanctified this morning. I'm asking, has the gospel of Jesus Christ done anything for you? Has it done anything for you? Has it touched your heart? Has he broken up the inner man of your soul? Has he blessed you and broke you down, friend? Do you know about Jesus and his shed blood and his wonderful melting, molding, and shaping and breaking presence in our life? Listen, friends, those hands and those feet, they saved me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But I still nailed them there, and so did you. That beautiful place in his side, that gash that was put there, is a refuge for my soul. But I'm still the one, and you are, you are as well, that put the thing right in his side. It was your sin and mine, friend, that caused him to bleed upon Calvary. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Amen. That ought to break us up, friend. And the greatest example in all of the Bible is the brokenness of Jesus Christ upon the cross. Amen. He became the broken bread of heaven, the lamb that was slain, as it were, before the foundations of the world. Oh, how necessary it is this morning, friend, to be broken. To be broken. Don't wait, friend, on God to break you. Present yourself to him and be broken. Amen. 
to be broken this morning is what we want to look at in this message. We want to notice the following conditions of brokenness. We must remember, friend, again, that it's a broken and contrite heart that God dwells in. A broken and contrite heart that God dwells in. To be broken this morning, I would suggest to you, is to be empty. Is to be empty. Broken vessels can't hold anything. They immediately become empty. And oh, how full we are. How full we are of, of ourselves before we're broken. Amen. Is everybody all right out there? Amen. When we're broken, we're empty. We're empty out. We're emptied out of all that pride. All of that pride. God can't stand pride, friend. Did you know that? Full of pride. If you're not, if you're not emptied out, friend of pride, you're in trouble. I hope you're not proud of yourself. I hope you don't think that you're just it. Did you look in the mirror this morning? I don't know if there's a good looking one among us. A lot of ugly people around. But you know, there's some people who can really stare at themselves in the mirror. Say, boy, I look pretty good. got mirrors all over the cell all over the place so they can see themselves pride pride just kind of full up of themselves just kind of love themselves well I'm really something brother friend you're not too you're not too hot you're just not it you're not all that much the world's not revolving around you the world was going on a long time before you ever arrived. Your wife could probably get along without you. Your husband probably could too. You're not all that special. And then you young people, don't think that everybody's looking at you. A lot of times when you're 15, 16, you just kind of feel like everybody's watching me. I know, I used to be at 15 or 16. But everybody's just watching me. Hardly anybody's watching you. Except for your mom and dad and the Lord. But you're not all that hot, friend. So you might as well just be broken and be emptied out of yourself. You know, God has a way of knocking, knocking the wind out of us. Have you ever had anybody just kind of walk up to you and go, boom, right in the stomach? You don't have much to say in a time like that, do you? You don't feel like fighting back then, do you? You're doubled up. You're holding on. God has a way of knocking the wind out of you. When I was a little fellow, about eight years old, they had a place up by the football field in this little town where we used to live in. It was called the Foundry. It was just an old building that they used for a foundry. Fellas would go up there and play ping pong. They'd go up there and lift weights, you know. Some of the big football players that were 17 and 18 years old would come to lift weights. When I was about eight years old, those fellas that were 17 and 18, they looked like giants to me. And we'd go up there, seven and eight years old, and go up and watch some of those big football players lift weights. And there was this one fellow, his name was Smitty. And Smitty was a big linebacker for the football team. And he thought he was really it. He'd stand there, you know, over those weights. He had his white shirt on, you know, that T-shirt with them, with just this band here in his old arms flexing, you know. Had his nice tan, had his rosin on here, put his powder on, his white towel around his neck. And he'd come over and he'd kind of roll the barbells out. Big, heavy weights. One time I went over to try to lift him up and I couldn't even move him off the floor at all. And old Smitty came over there this one morning, I'll never forget it. And he got down over that thing and got his hands on it and got another grip, you know, and made a big breath. My eyes were just about popping out. I couldn't even move it. He took one step back, going, oh, and we were.
were just watching all of his muscles flex. And then he backed off and put it right down. And we just sat there in awe. And by that time, the door flung open. And this fellow walked in about the size of Brother Smart, built just about like Brother Smart. His name was Poss. And Poss worked up in the coal mines. He had to go to work, he had to quit school, but he worked in the coal mines. And he'd just been in the coal mines all that morning, and he came through there, and he was all dirty and black and sweaty. And he walked in, he said, fellas, what's going on? One little boy said, well, we're just watching Smitty. Smitty just lift that weight right there. He said, oh, yeah, is that right? Smitty, you just lift that one up? Yeah, just lift that one up. He said, that one right there? He said, yeah. Old Poss just went over, he said, my, oh, my, that looks pretty heavy. He got a hold of it. Boy, mm. Smitty just took his towel off, kind of walked out. Yeah. Friend, there's always somebody that can do it better than you. Always somebody. You're going to need to be emptied out of pride, friend. Broken vessels and empty vessel, empty of pride. You'll need to be broken and empty of all of the envy and jealousy. I hope you're not jealous over anybody. Hatred will have to go. Bitterness, are you bitter towards anybody today, friend? Bitterness is something that needs to be gotten out of the life. If we're broken, we're emptied of all bitterness. We don't have any bitterness on board. We're not bitter at Brother Gray. We're not bitter at the church. We're not bitter at the holiness movement. That's right. Amen. We just lay down all that bitterness. You know, there's a lot of bitterness in our ranks. I remember a young teenage boy that got back to God. He prayed his way through, and his confession was, Oh, God, forgive me of bitterness. And you know, he wasn't bitter at his mom and dad. His mom and dad were pastoring the church. He wasn't bitter at them, but you know who he was bitter against? He was bitter against the people in the church that were treating his mom and dad bad. I'm not saying his bitterness was justified, friend, but sometimes there's reason for bitterness. But that boy got emptied out of that bitterness. I hope you're not carrying any bitterness around. We need, friends, as a people and as individuals continually to fall upon the Lord. We need to fall upon the Lord and stay broken and stay humble and contrite before Him. Amen. Amen. Friend, don't let your head swell. If you do a little crying, a little weeping, it won't swell, thank God. It'll leak. But we need to fall upon the Lord today. I trust you'll fall on him. I can remember one time going up on a mountain where we had a monkey swing. You know what a monkey swing is? We had a monkey swing. It was a long piece of cable extended out of a high oak tree. And us boys would go up there and we'd pull that cable back, had a little loop in the bottom of it, and we'd pull it way back and jump up on it and swing right out over to the tops of the trees on the side of the mountain. And there was a pathway there with rocks down across it and we'd go swinging out over there just having a big time one morning we ran up there and one fella jumped on the swing and he was going out and screaming all the way you know having fun when he came back I just thought I'll grab a hold and go with him and I grabbed a hold and went with him but my grip didn't hold very well and all of a sudden I slipped loose and came crashing down right on the rocks between those trees I laid there started to cry my side was bleeding right through my shirt. My buddy was up here swinging, laughing the whole time. Laughing. I didn't think it was funny at all. No. Not at all. He didn't offer to help me. I got up. I held my side. I walked home, hobbled all the way home with a bleeding side and cracked ribs. Nobody cared. Nobody cared. But you know something, friend? One day, hallelujah, I fell upon the stone that the builders rejected. I came there hurting, and I fell upon him, and I cried, and I asked for help. Yes, sir. And you know what? God never laughed at me. 
God never laughed at me. He didn't say you deserve that. Go ahead and squall and bawl a little while. You should have been doing a better job. No, sir. He took me just as I was. All my hurts, all my sorrows, and I fell upon him. Hallelujah. And he bound up my soul and bound up my bruises and bound up my broken ribs. Thank God. Friend, we need to fall upon him and be broken and be emptied out this morning and continue to stay emptied out. Amen. Oh, friend, just go ahead and fall on him. Fall on him this morning. To be broken also this morning is to be weeping. John eleven thirty five, 35, shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept, right? When we're broken in spirit, we'll be weeping. We won't be crybabies, thank God. We won't be crybabies. We got enough of them around, but we'll be weeping. We'll be moved with tears from time to time. The world says if you cry, you're a wimp, you're a sissy. That's what they say. I don't care what the world says, friend. I don't care what the world says. Charles Bronson, a famous movie star, big tough guy out there in Hollywood, he says if you cry, you're a wimp. I'd have liked to have seen him when his house was on fire here just the other year when those raging fires were sweeping through California. I'd have liked to ask him then about being a wimp. Amen. There used to be a worldly song out, Big Girls Don't Cry. Big girls don't cry. I remember them singing that when I was in my teens. Big girl, girls don't cry. That's right, maybe. Big girls maybe don't cry. But good girls cry. Holy girls cry. People that come to Jesus will shed some tears. Fred, amen. The problem is we've hardened our hearts and we've held back our tears. We need to come to God, amen, and be broken and weeping before him. Friends, there needs to be some weeping between the porch and the altar, amen, for the lost and for the dying and for our own soul. Amen. Oh, yes, friend, the broken weeping spirit is the answer for church apathy. Apathy means a lack of feeling, lack of passion and emotion. Just means plain old indifference. My, doesn't that sound like a lot of church people? The broken weeping spirit, friend, is the answer for lukewarmness in our church. Amen, friend. You want to start a hotbed in your church, have a broken, weeping spirit there where people will sense your concern and your love. I tell you, tears speak awful loud, friend. Yes. Amen. Oh, praise God. Amen. Not long ago, I was walking through a Walmart back in Ohio. As I came into the Walmart store, the fellow was there that said, Welcome to Walmart. They're always there, aren't they? Welcome to Walmart. Welcome to Walmart. As I walked into Walmart, you know, as you go through the door, it's not long, and you get right to the ladies' section, the dresses. Isn't that amazing? You always nail the ladies right away. But the section of dresses is right there. And as I was walking down through there, I was going in to buy a pair of trousers. And as I looked to my left, I saw a lady standing there. And when I seen her, I thought, oh, no. No, that can't be. And I kept walking. And it really bothered me. This lady had short hair, earrings, a pair of blue jeans on. And I thought, Lord, that can't be sister so-and-so. It just can't be her. It can't be her, Lord. And I turned around to go back and I kind of made my way over through the men's section and she was working her way through the ladies' section and I seen her and it was Brother Smart. It was Sister So-and-So. And I hadn't seen her for about a year and a half and here she was, she had gone back on God. Cut hair, blue jeans on, earrings in the whole works. And I thought, oh Lord, help her. And I didn't want to even talk to her you know I just I just I didn't want to make her feel ashamed and so I walked through the store and did my business and I got to thinking about her and I felt bad 
But then when I get out in the car, it seemed like the Lord said, son, perhaps you didn't feel bad enough. You know, I thought the same thoughts maybe you'd think. How could she do that? What went wrong? Why do people let down? There they go cutting their hair off again. There they go compromising again, you know. Some of those thoughts go through the mind. They're kind of cold thoughts, aren't they? Boy, it's awful quiet in here this morning now. And we can sit around and talk about them, you know. Boy, they lost out. They've compromised, and they have. As I was driving home, I thought, Lord, help me. It was just like the Lord said, Son, maybe if you'd have had enough of the glory on your soul, maybe you would have been moved and stirred with tears, and you would have walked right up to that sister with a broken and contrite heart, and went up and said, Sister, what's happened? What's gone wrong? And maybe God could have touched her heart. But Brother Beecher, I missed it. Friends, I'll tell you, tears that do a lot for us sometimes. Right, right, right. It's a whole lot easier to be critical than it is to have tears in our hearts for all situations, friend. Yes, we can cry over the loss, but can we cry over those that are backsliding and those that are going away from us in the wrong direction? They need our tears. Lukewarm religion, friend, is absolutely disgusting, and it, it doesn't taste good at all. You just kind of want to spew it out of your mouth, and that's what Jesus said he was going to do, spew it out of his mouth. Broken, weeping spirit is the answer for church lethargy, and lethargy means unhealthy drowsiness, unnaturally prolonged slumber and listlessness, a state of inaction. Mm. It means just sleeping in church. Sleeping in church. I kind of like being this far away from a crowd because I can't tell whether you're sleeping or you just kind of have your head down in prayer for me. Or maybe you're like one fellow said, well, I'm just checking my eyelids for holes. I just, if you're sleeping out there, you got your eyes shut, that's what I'll either believe this morning. You're either praying for me or you're checking your eyelids for holes this morning. But there's a lot of sleepers in the church. I started teaching a Sunday school class back there in 1980, not long after I got saved. I don't know why they did it, but they thrust me right into an adult Sunday school class. I was only saved a year. Whew, boy, that was almost more than I could take. But there was this one fella, as soon as Sunday school would start, He'd sit there on his, on his Sunday school chair like this, and he'd sit there with the quarterly wide open, and as soon as I'd start talking, sometimes slobber would run out of his mouth. Every once in a while, he'd drop the, he'd drop the quarterly on the floor. One time, he dropped the quarterly on the floor and never woke up. But it never failed. It never failed. As soon as the class was over, he was wide awake. I've never seen anybody walk into a church sleeping. No, no. Sleepwalking might be a blessing <laughs> in the church. I've never seen anybody walk out of the church sleeping. Do you know why a lot of people sleep in church? It's because they get too much sleep. There's some people who just get too much sleep. They sleep in the afternoon, take a little nap, take a little nap in the morning after breakfast, take a little nap in the afternoon after lunch, take a little nap after, in the evening, take a little nap in church. They're just taking a little nap all the time. They sleep eight hours a night, take a little nap. Their bodies are so run down, their metabolism so low. As soon as they park themselves, they go to sleep. And they say, oh, boy, I'm tired. Friend, you know what you need to do? You need to start running in place. You need to get your blood circulating. You need to move around. Amen. Get that oxygen flowing through the bloodstream. And you won't fall asleep so easy, friend. Amen. God help these fellas and ladies that are always sleeping in the house of the Lord. Always sleep. Friend, fight sleep. Fight it. If you're that tired, fight it. Slap yourself on the face. Tickle the roof of your mouth with your tongue. Do something, friend. Stay alive and stay awake. You say that doesn't work. You just try tickling the roof of your mouth with your tongue. It'll do something to you. It'll wake you up a little bit. 
Shout hallelujah once in a while, but don't go to sleep. I can remember not long after I was saved, I was teaching that Sunday school class, and this was before I walked in the light of working on the Sabbath. You pray for me. Took me a little bit of time to break of that, and when they started preaching on it, I quit that job. But I had a midnight, midnight job to 8.30 in the morning. And the last shift of the week was midnight Sunday night to 8.30 Sunday morning. Amen. You say, already I wouldn't have that guy teaching my Sunday school class. Well, they didn't have a lot of wisdom there, I guess, but uh, the Lord took care of all that. He took care of all that. But I had such a desire to go to the house of the Lord on Sunday morning. I'd hit that time clock and I'd run. I had a 15 mile drive to make. I would run to the car. I would go as fast as I would go down the highway. If the speed limit was 65, I went 65 and wherever the radar would allow, that's where I would travel. <laughs> that doesn't always go over good, but that's just the truth of the matter. And I would hurry to get home because church started, Sunday school started at 9.30. Now, we had two little children at that time, and my wife wasn't one of these that laid in bed. If she would, I'd have turned the mattress over on her and got her out of bed. But she wasn't one of these ladies that laid in bed and, and, didn't get, and had their house coat on till about 11 o'clock, you know, stirring around having four or five cups of coffee, and they're always late. Oh, I can't get anything done. These children are driving me crazy. I can't get the house clean. Get out of bed. Get dressed and get up. As soon as you get out of bed, make the bed. Yeah. Amen. Hey, man, make the bed. Sure. Hey, man, you can come over into my room anytime over here in this little cottage where I'm staying. As soon as I get up in the morning, I make the bed. The only way it's going to be unmade is if I pull the top cover down to get the pillows off to lay them on the floor by the bed to kneel on. And I don't know if I put the pillows back on the bed this morning or not. Can't remember now. But we would come home. My wife was up early. She knew that I was in a hurry, brother. She had the children ready to go. She had my clothes laid out on the bed. I came in the door taking my clothes off, running to the bathroom, hit the shower, came out of the shower, got dressed, and we were in the car and off to church and never late one time in two years. And I was up all night long. And then I'd teach the Sunday school class, sit through church, and never fell asleep once. Did you fight sleep? Absolutely. Were there times where you're tired? Yes, there was times when I was tired, but I wouldn't allow myself to go to sleep. Amen. 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 We'd come home from church. We'd have Sunday dinner. I'd go to bed for about four hours, get up, go to choir practice at 6 o'clock, be there for the prayer meeting at 7 o'clock and pray till 20 after, be in the sanctuary at 7.30. Sure. And church again and have been up all night and all day except for those few hours. Friend, we need to get awake. We need to get broken and have a, a weeping spirit that will cause us not to be full of lukewarmness and church apathy. Oh, that's a real encouragement to your pastor when you just kind of sit there checking your eyelids for holes. You know, some Christians in the church, they remind me of a house fly. A house fly. Now, not the kind of house fly you're thinking of. Not that kind of house fly that's always buzzing around in the inside of the house, and the one you're swatting at. Not that house fly that's after the horse and after the cow that's always swishing her tail. No, that house fly that's on the wall of the house when the temperature's about 30 degrees and it's listless and it can't even move and you can just kind of go over there and go like that and the fly goes. That's how some people in the church are, listless froze up oh god break us up until we weep break us up until we wake up lord break us up i believe this morning also that a broken spirit will be usable and to be usable our will must be broken and this where the, this is where the broken vessel can receive shaping and dressing if you please and conforming and you'll have a teachable spirit if you're broken you'll come to the house of the lord friend wanting to be used wanting to get help from god wanting to drink in truth wanting to be shaped by the lord 
you'll have a teachable spirit. You know, some people, it doesn't seem like they can learn anything. Do you ever get around those fellas that know it all? I mean, brother, every subject you bring up, they know they have an answer for. They just know everything. You can't get a word in edgewise around them. <laughs> they know it all. You know, there's some young people like that, too. Some teenagers like that. They know more than their mom and dad. They just know it all. Boy, I was a know it all when I was 18. I thought I knew everything. It wasn't long, friend, when I got on my own, I realized I didn't know hardly anything. It reminds me about a picture that was in the Cincinnati Enquirer a number of years ago. A man had erected a billboard on his front lawn in the Cincinnati area. And he said, for sale. It was a big for sale sign. It said, for sale. One set of encyclopedias. Teenage son knows it all. Friends, when you're broken, you'll be usable and you'll be able to learn. You'll have a teachable spirit. Amen. The know-it-all attitude will be gone. You'll realize the teacher does know more than you. Mom and dad knows more than you. Are you able to learn without kicking? You know, horses aren't usable until they're broken. You've got to break a horse's will. Oh, we like to see those Mustangs running out across the prairie, you know. And oh, aren't they beautiful. But go up and try to get a bridle on them, friend, or put a saddle on them. It's not going to work. You're going to have to break that horse. You're going to have to flick some pain on that horse. You're going to have to take that horse and do like my grandfather used to do. He had a, a, a noose that went around their neck with nails sticking in. And he'd put it around and he'd just tighten it up every time. And the nails would dig into their side. But oh, when that horse is broken, isn't it beautiful? Aren't those big old Belgians that the Amish people and those big old Perchins, aren't they beautiful when they're walking out through a field and plowing? Aren't they beautiful? They're broken animals. They're usable. Aren't dogs really nice when they're broken? <laughs> aren't they? Isn't it a mess when a dog's out of control? Isn't it wonderful when children are broken? You know, the sad thing is some dogs listen better than some people's children. That's the truth. Huh. Isn't it something you go in some of these stores and you'll see a mother and her children are out of control and they're just screaming and carrying on and pulling that stuff on the shelf. Give me that, give me that, give me that, give me that. No, Johnny, it's okay. No, you can't have that. I'll buy you a popsicle if you don't touch that. I'll get you a present. I'll get you something if you just don't do that. Baloney, friend. Ought to just pull off your belt and let them have it. You wouldn't have to do that at Kroger's or, or Newmart if you did it at home. Praise God. I have a friend of mine down in Gent, Kentucky. He's 30, let's see, Amos is uh, he's 38 or 39 got nine children you ought to see how they act when they go in the supermarket they're Amish he was in a supermarket one day him and his wife had the children and one lady came up to him and said how in the world do you stand it with all those children how can you take it he looked up with a real humble smile and he said all of these children are a blessing from the Lord. God's given us all them. He's like the man that had his quiver full of them, brother. He was blessed. Amen. But I said some people's dogs listen better than some children do. I read of a fellow that had a dog, and he'd always, this dog liked to sleep out on the railroad bed, right between the two rails. And for years he slept there. And whenever a train would come, the dog could hear it a long ways off, and he'd get up and get off the tracks. But that dog grew older, and his hearing started to go bad. And one day he was out there on the train tracks right in the middle, taking a good long nap, and here comes the train down the track. It's getting closer and closer and closer, 
He doesn't even hear it. His hearing was about completely gone now. All of a sudden, the dog gets up, and it's too late to get off of the tracks. But by that time, his owner comes out and just sees what's happening, and the dog is looking over the owner's way, and the owner goes like that, just went like that. And the dog just went right down, and the train went right over top of him, and he was all right. Just think about that dog listening like that. Do your children listen like that? Always got to be yelling at them and hollering at them. <laughs> Friend, you don't need to raise your voice so many times to them. They need to be broken so they can be usable. Humans, human beings are not usable really until they're broken. Friend, if you're broken, God can use you. You are fit for some work in the church because you're broken. Your kicking will be gone. Your own way will be gone. Your selfish interests that would hinder the work of God are out of the road. We need to be broken so that we can be usable for Almighty God, friend. Yeah, yeah. To be broken is to be blessed and blessable. And I'm not talking about a little pain that may produce a temporary blessing, but a brokenness that brings a blessedness to our souls. Amen. A blessedness to our souls. Amen. We're able to get blessed, shout, praise the Lord, to be filled with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Let me ask you something. Are you blessable? Could you really be blessed? This kind of blessedness does away with professionalism does away with professionalism and, and causes us to experience God. Don't you get sick of all this professionalism in the church? Amen. Professional preaching. We went into one place and we were visiting and it's amazing what little children can say. And we heard this fellow preach and oh, it was, it was amazing. It was kind of a nominal church. And we came out of there and my boy said to me, he said, Dad, and this was back just not long after we'd gotten rid of our television. And he said, Dad, just a young fellow, he said, Dad, he said, that preacher reminded me of a game show host. Just kind of artificial. You know, just not real, professional. Professional preaching, just kind of mechanical. Professional singing. Boy, don't you just love the Victory Street. I was thinking about how they've been singing in this camp meeting, and I was thinking about all the songs that they wrote, all the songs that God has given them and blessed them. My, they must live in a state of revival to have that many songs coming to them. Don't you just get sick of this plastic-type singing, this Christian-type singing, you know, that's just not there? You get to see some of these fellas, you know, and I've seen them in the bookstores with their pictures, and they've got their shirts opened up about three buttons down. Hair that's out over the collar. Amen, hair by the fellas out over the collar. That doesn't look good. Friend, I cut mine off. You ought to do the same if yours is way down over your collar. You know what they say? That's one, now, this is really amazing, but they say that that's the thing that's a, so attractive to a homosexual is the hair of a man down over the collar. Brother, for that reason alone, I think I'd want it off the collar. But you take these professional singers, they're all dolled up. I'm talking about the Christian singers now, these so-called Christian singers. Friend, I'm not going to pay $10 to go and hear them. I'm not going to run off somewhere and pay 10 or $20 to hear the cathedral sing. I'm not going to do it. I've never asked anybody to pay to hear me preach. I believe the laborer is worthy of his hire. I believe that they ought to be paid in some of these circles, friend. But as far as putting a price tag on it, I wonder how many we'd have here this morning if the price tag was $20 to get through the door. Probably not many. You'd have to almost be out of your mind to pay that to listen to me. But I tell you, I'm not going to go to that stuff too much of the world there rubbing shoulders with too many types of religions that I don't want to be around I don't want it to rub off on me hey man 
I want to know how they're living. Some of them aren't living very good. Some of them aren't living very good. God help us. I've never been there, but I had, a, I had an individual tell me that they were at a certain place and they seen some holiness people at that place. And I mean, they said those people were just sitting there all smiles. They'd get up and wave their arms around when the people... And I know some of those same people, they come to our circles and our churches and they're dead. But oh, they can get rocking and moving and waving around, boy, when they're in them big concerts, amen. You people over here on this side, you clap and move back and forth like this. You people over on this side, you clap and move back and forth like this. And oh, we're just having a big time. professionalism friend friend be careful what you listen to might as well just go the whole route here you might as well just be careful what you listen to amen when it comes to this Christian rock music and contemporary beats friends that shouldn't be around us there was a song when I was growing up a rock and roll song it said give me that good old rock and roll music it's got a backbeat you can't lose it and that's the truth friend there's a backbeat in the rock and roll sound that's anti-God. It's anti the rhythm of my mind and my heart and yours as well that God created us in. It's anti-God. It's anti the way the system of the universe is even in operation. And it doesn't matter whether the label's Christian or not. If it's Christian and even if the words say, I love Jesus with all my heart, if the rock beat is there, it's anti-God. And it's going to do something to you whether you believe it or not. It'll touch your subconscious mind. It'll make you irritable. And it'll certainly keep you away from the deep truths of God in your soul. Be careful with anything that's marked Christian if it's got that backbeat in it. Amen. Somebody said, well, I'll say got, somebody got saved under that. Friend, if they get saved and get around it long, they'll get out from it. They'll get away from it. God's merciful in a lot of areas, but friend, that thing is anti-God. It's anti-God. It does away with religion. This broken, blessed spirit does away with religion and brings salvation. It does away with legalism. Friend, when you're blessed and blessable, you're not a legalist. Thank God. I believe in keeping the standards of the church. I believe in keeping the law, friend. But friend, a legalist is in trouble. If I see Brother Reigns over in the Kmart store, and I see, happen to see Brother Reigns walking through the TV section, I'm not going to run over there and grab Brother Reigns by the arm and say, Brother Reigns, don't look at any of those TVs. Try to get him out of there as fast as I can. I'm not even going to worry about him. I'm not even going to think twice about it. I'm just going to let him walk on through. If God can't keep him from it, I'm sure not going to. Amen, friend. Some of these things we think is causing us a problem, really the problem's down in the heart. Some of these churches, they split over certain things, and then it's not long after they split over that certain thing that they're, they're all going worldly. Friend, the problem's in the heart. They're not broken, not blessable. Amen. But listen, friend, you don't have to be a legalist. You know what the legalist is? He's a fellow that knows where the law of God is, and he's so afraid of breaking that law, he's such in such a binder that he makes all of these other little laws over here to stay away from God's law. So he has all of these right here, so he never even gets close to God's law. And he's keeping all his own little laws and little rules and little notions, you know. He's a legalist. Then on the other hand of it, if you're blessed and blessable, it'll keep you out of liberalism as well. Praise the Lord. You won't have to go around justifying everything you do. You just won't want to do it. You won't be able to say, well, the Lord makes exception for me. I can go out and eat Sunday dinner after church. You won't be working out any little deals with God. You'll just be living for the Lord if you're liberated. 
friend, there's a beautiful, beautiful highway that stretches right to the golden strands of heaven. Amen. And it's a beautiful highway of grace this morning. And I'm telling you this morning, on that highway is a beautiful pathway. There's a ditch on the left. It's legalism. There's a ditch on the right. It's liberalism. And friend, there's a beautiful pathway that leads right to heaven. And it's the liberated pathway of the soul that knows Jesus. Amen. And if we're liberated on our soul, hallelujah, we won't be legalists, we won't be liberal. Thank God we'll be liberated. And we'll be blessed and blessable and be able to be used by God. We'll be broken and weeping before Him. Amen. Oh, friends, I'll tell you, it brings the blessing when we're broken and blessed. It just brings the blessing and we have freedom in our soul. And oh, how good it is to be blessed with freedom in Jesus Christ to be free in our soul. Amen. Just get rid, friend. Just get rid of all that stuffy old dignity. <laughs> just get rid of all that stuffy old dignity. I just despise going to the doctor. Is there anybody that likes to go to the doctor? Don't answer that. I, I'm just convinced probably today there are. There's people who just seem to love to go to the doctor. They got a little hangnail on their little toe and they want to go to the doctor. Maybe if people wouldn't have insurance, they wouldn't be running the doctor all the time. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. Say you're against doctors. Not against doctors. They just don't like to go to doctors. Amen. I've sat in that room too many times when that fella come in there with his white coat on. Them rooms are always cold, aren't they? I want you to come in and sit down on this metal table. The table's cold. He had sweaty hands, but it's a cold sweat. <laughs> and here comes this fella in, and he's about as cold as he can be. Got a white coat on. Got that magnifying glass on his head, you know, stethoscope around his neck and a blood pressure thing here. And then that little, little wooden thing down in his pocket here, one hand behind his back, and you don't know if he's going to say, open up and say, ah, or if he's got a needle and he's going to say, bend over. But you know something? We've got some people around the church like this. They're always in a diagnostic mode. They're diagnosing everybody. They're looking at them, see how they're dressed, see how they're looking, just checking them out and checking them over. They're just diagnosed. And they're about as cold as ice, and you never want to get near them. You don't want to be around those type of individuals. Hey, Amen. Some people are like that. They're not broken. They're not blessed. They're not blessable. They're just about ready to stick you all the time. Let me ask you something, Christian. Are you approachable or are you the doctor type? We need to be broken so that we can be blessed and free indeed in the Lord. Listen, are you all bound up with religion? Are you trying to keep the law? Have you become professional? Are you not free this morning? Why not fall on the Lord? Why not fall on him and be broken this morning? To be broken is to be bleeding. To be bleeding, that speaks of compassion and concern, speaks of sacrifice. What is ours is for the benefit of others, whether it's our time, our talents, our treasures. Amen. We're broken, we're bleeding, we want to help individuals. Friend, if you're a bleeding type of an individual, you've been broken and you're bleeding, you're going to get involved with people. You know, the doctor never gets involved with you, does he? Once in a while, they ask you how it works. He'll give you a couple of pills and send you out. Doesn't even call to check up on you. All he wants is your money. Well, that's the way some people are. Some preachers, I guess, are like that. But if you're a bleeding individual, you're broken and bleeding for the Lord, you're going to get involved with some individuals. And it's going to cost you something to get involved. It may cost you some gas in your tank. It may cost you some heartache. It may cost you some blood and some sweat and some tears and some hurts and some strains and some misunderstandings. It's going to cost you something. And if you don't want that, friend, then stay away from the kingdom of God. 
But friend, if you want to help God and you want to work in the kingdom, be broken and be bleeding so that you can be used and be a sacrificial individual for others, God will have grace. He'll pour in the oil. Hey, man, friend, you don't have to worry about becoming infected or being sick on this. No, sir, he'll pour in the oil. He has an antiseptic to help us along the way, a balm for us, amen, to bind up the broken and revive those that are humble, amen. To be broken this morning is to be the dwelling place of God. Friend, I ask you, have you been truly broken up? I hope you get broken up. Because if you don't, you might come to the point where you would be broken down. Broken down. We've got enough people that are broken down. Let's pray that we have some that are broken up. If we are broken, let's stay broken and contrite before him. Why not become empty and weeping and usable and blessed, bleeding in the dwelling place of God? We must be broken up, friend. We must be broken up. Finally, this morning, a broken spirit is always a believing spirit. A broken spirit is always a believing spirit. And if we're a believer, then we're a receiver. Amen? As soon as we believe God, we receive. So if we become broken, then we can believe, and in turn, we can receive. What a deal that is. That's the deal of all deals, friend. We're broken, we're believing, and we're receiving. Amen.